Hi everyone, uh, this is the last problem from lecture today. We were rushing through the example, so I thought I would re-record uh, a solution for you guys and put it up front here in this video. So this problem here is giving us H2 and O2 are reacting, reacting uh, to form water in a closed container. After the reaction is complete, we have six moles of water have been produced. Four moles of oxygen remain. Based on the theoretical yield, or 100% yield, how many moles of gas were initially in the container. Okay, so the things that are important to think here is that after the reaction, we have zero H2, because the one of the two reactants has to be totally consumed. We have four moles of O2 present, and then we have six moles of H2O present. Now, we could set up a BCA chart. So we could set up a chart that says we have two H2 plus O2 forming water, two waters, and that if we initially have reactants present that we don't know how much we have, that we're losing uh, or gaining um, 2x in, in the case of water, that we're losing x in minus 2x on H2 and O2. And we're going to be left with 4 moles of O2, and we're going to gain and form 6 moles of H2O. Um, this here is what allows me to solve for x, so x is equal to 3.0 moles and so then we are losing three moles of um, O2 and we're losing 6.0 moles of H2 I'm just wanting to write the moles and not the H2 so minus six moles is two times X so if we're gonna be left with zero in terms of H2 then initially we have to have six moles of H2 present. So we lose all of it, we're left with zero. And then initially we have to have seven moles of O2 and then no water. So the answer would be 13 moles. Okay, now the question is, I got this after class a couple times, can we solve this just with dimensional analysis? And I think we can we just have to probably think through this first. So we have to at least first sort of reckon or realize that we have no H2 left after the reaction, four moles of O2, six moles of water. So we could probably figure out the moles of H2 that had to have reacted to produce the six moles of water. And it's just a one-to-one -one ratio or a two moles of water that are produced means two moles of H2 initially had to be present to react with oxygen. So that's gonna be six moles of H2 and then if we do this for O2, that had to be present initially um, to react with H2, it would be six moles of water that are produced, would come from, for every two moles of water, one mole of O2. So that'll give us three moles of O2 that initially had to have been present to react with this quantity of H2. So six moles H2 initially present Three moles of the O2 initially present gives us nine. And then we just add the four moles of oxygen that are left over after the reaction, we come up with 13. Okay, so two ways to think through this problem. You can use a BCA chart that might be helpful. You can at least go through, and I think the key is realizing that H2 has to be zero. I think that's one part that's kind of like not super clear from reading the problem that you may be stuck on is you have to realize that one of the reactants is completely gone or else then we wouldn't have hit the theoretical yield. Um, so the H2 has to be zero since we are told we are left with O2. So our, our plan for today is to do some more review problems. Um, I got a question on, there was one really random hard question on the practice exams. We'll go through that cadmium uh, lead problem. You guys probably have seen the question, know the one I'm talking about. We'll go through that problem, hopefully try to tell you that, there, you know, occasionally there are problems on a test that are really gauging problem solving ability. And that's not one to be super scared about in terms of seeing a replica of a question just like that one. It's just, you know, sometimes you can imagine asking questions in a tricky way that just try to get you to use some of the content that we've been learning about. Um, in, in sort of solving the problem. So for tonight's exam, again, make sure to have one of those calculators. Make sure to bring, uh, I, I guess a pen or pencil would work, because you're not, uh, if you're taking a written test, obviously bring a pencil for your scan sheet. 
Uh, make sure to listen carefully to the instructions. You know, they're gonna give you a sort of uh, password once you get to the test. If you happen to have downloaded the wrong test, like we had this issue last night, some of you guys got this email about submitting your test by you know, sometime last night. That had to do with at some point if you had signed up for some other Chem 1210 class and then somehow got into the roster for some other course. So you may have possibly downloaded the wrong test. So when you go into Examplify, I don't know what it looks like, but you should see a couple of tests to download. Some of you guys are also in like site classes that are also using uh, Exemplify. But you might see more than one like Gen Chem exam. Um, does anybody see more than one that, that, so if you see more than one, I don't know how you can tell the difference between which one's ours versus the other class you were enrolled in earlier. Just know that the password they give you will work for the right test. So if your password doesn't work, go open that other test. And if you can download all the tests that you can see, then you'll be ready to go. So be, be ready at the test. Um, there's a post, I sent an announcement last night. If you haven't seen the announcement, um, that kind of goes through. If you're getting a paper test, what happens when you walk in the room? Uh, 100 independence is where the exam is. Uh, then if you're using Exemplify, there's another set of instructions kind of, of what to expect when you walk in the exam room. So you might read through those instructions so you're just like clear on what to expect. Uh, things are always hectic in the first few minutes to start the test. Um, I think we have the room for like 75 minutes. They're planning five minutes to get the test running. Um, so just try to be prepared, uh, be ready to listen for those commands. And as soon as they say go, you can put your password in and then you're going. They'll, um, somebody was just telling me that there's like a little stop sign you'll see as soon as you put your password into Exemplify where it might say stop for instructions. There it's, the proctors are gonna tell you just to go. As soon as you put your password in, you can continue the exam and start it um, right away. So again, if you haven't downloaded the test or if you see more than one test, try to download all of those. Um, when you get to the test, like I said, if you do see two midterms and the password doesn't work, just switch to the other exam, put that password in, and it should be good to go. Um, any general questions about the test or anything? Yes? So if you have an iPad, do you have to take the test on the iPad? That is the basic rule, that if you do have a university iPad that they really do <laughs> want um, and we'll be uh, generally enforcing it, you take it on the iPad. Um, they, I think they give everybody like one out in terms of showing up without a charged iPad or uh, if you lose it or something like that before the exam. Um, so I think everybody gets like one chance to take the test with like out any kind of penalty or something like that on paper. But um, if you ask me, I've always had cases every semester where somebody miskeys something on that paper scan sheet. So I think uh, in terms of taking the test on the uh, a device versus paper, I think a device is gonna be the more, more foolproof option for taking the test without making, um, without, without having to worry about keying in something wrong in the bubble sheet. Yeah. They will give you a scratch paper booklet at the test um, if, if you're taking it with Exemplify. Obviously if you take a paper test, you'll get the pa paper test booklet. But I think either way you take the test, you get like a separate work booklet to like do your work in. Um, so you'll get a scratch paper booklet. Make sure to turn that in. They're going to collect ID cards because they don't want you writing the questions down on your scratch paper booklet then running away. So they will be collecting the scratch paper booklets. Okay, um, any other questions? Uh, yes? So when you're taking the test and you have one question the next, are you allowed to go back first? Yes, yes. So the, um, if you look at the practice test, I haven't looked at it very carefully but because I don't think I can even see it since I'm not a student in the class. But you should see like a display of the questions on the left side. And then whenever you click on a question, you see it in the middle. Um, you can go back and change answers. You can, uh, it, dis doesn't, it displays the questions in a different way if you've answered it versus not answered it. So it should be pretty clear when you're taking the test if you have answered or haven't answered a particular question. Um, the, uh, the one thing I wanted to mention is there's no penalty for guessing. I mean, that's probably assumed, but a few of you may be wondering, should I guess if I don't know? And absolutely, you should guess on the questions if you don't know the answer. Um, so, also, uh, to give one other thing for Exemplify, one, uh, a couple years ago I had a student who missed the question and then you know how all the answers then are shifted on your scan sheet. So if you key in number five is the answer for four and carry on the rest of your test. And <laughs> the student got like a 20% on the exam. And th they wouldn't, the department wouldn't allow the scan sheet to be adjusted down by one. Um, so, so like things like that happen every semester um, on a paper test. I don't think anything like that can happen. The worst thing that can happen on the Exemplify test is that you don't submit the test. So once you take the test, you're on, you're in airplane mode. 
All you basically have to do is go back into normal mode and your test should submit. They're gonna try to get you to do that before you leave the room uh, by showing that your test is submitted. Um, but, uh, but so listen for that instruction. Make sure your test gets submitted at some point. If you aren't able to submit it in the exam room during the exam, as soon as you're back in Wi-Fi and connected, it should automatically submit. I think if you just reopen Exampleify, it submits at that time too. So just watch out for that and it, a potential email about submitting your test afterwards. Okay, so okay, so we've just gone through the problem O2, how much chromium do we need to react with it? And then likewise, how much chromium do we need to react with the given um, O2? Figure out which one made sense. Only one of those two ways makes sense. And if we choose right, if we had chosen the chromium first, then we wouldn't have even had to do the second run through on the dimensional analysis method. So if you choose correctly and get lucky, then you're only running through dimensional analysis uh, problem once. Follow-ups on that.
Okay, so we've just gone through the problem O2, how much chromium do we need to react with it? And then likewise, how much chromium do we need to react with the given um, O2? Figure out which one made sense. Only one of those two ways makes sense. And if we choose right, if we had chosen the chromium first, then we wouldn't have even had to do the second run through on the dimensional analysis method. So if you choose correctly and get lucky, then you're only running through dimensional analysis uh, problem once. Follow ups on that. Let's look at this problem here. This one probably gave you guys some fits. And on one hand, I could just tell you, you know, a problem like this one, don't let it bother you too much because this is just one of those random problems somebody came up with. It's like, hey, I got a problem that I think students who really understand the concepts will be able to solve. Um, so I wouldn't get too stressed out of, of this type of problem. But let's like, just think about how I might show a solution to this problem. So let's say we have a substance that has the characteristic properties of a metal and contains uh, more than one element that's called an alloy. I don't necessarily know why they're telling us that detail. Like, an alloy doesn't really mean a whole lot in this problem. It just kind of means it's a random mixture of, of, of metals. Um, it's not really a compound either, you know? So this isn't really something that should have some distinct formula like a molecular compound or an ionic compound. But be that as it may, it's just something that has a mixture, you know, of some amount of lead, tin, and cadmium. So all we know is that the mole ratio of tin to lead is 2.73 to 1. So, if, uh, so our mole ratio would be um, 2.73 moles of tin are present in a ratio to 1.00 moles of lead. Now, ratios are good because I can write things like um, conversion factors using dimensional analysis. Like I could write this. and use that in like a dimensional analysis step. So anytime I have like an equality or a ratio, then I can just write that and know that I can use that with dimensional analysis. And then we're told a mass ratio. We have the mass ratio of lead to cadmium is 1.78 to 1.00. So that means I have 1.78 grams of lead in a ratio to 1.00 grams of uh, cadmium. And so then if I think, I, I could write this too. I could write 1.78 grams of lead present for every 1.00 grams of cadmium and use that also if I need to perhaps within dimensional analysis. Now, let's just say hypothetically you had a sample that contained a gram of cadmium and 1.78 grams of lead. So let's just say hypothetically. You, you have a sample that has this quantity of cadmium, this ca uh, quantity of lead. Could you figure out for that particular sample how much tin it should contain in grams? Okay, because look at the question's asking. The question is saying, what is the mass percent of tin in the alloy? So what we want to know is the number of grams of tin in the compound would be the number of grams of tin d d compared to the number of grams of the whole compound. Or it's not really a compound, the number of grams of the alloy. So let's say alloy, where the alloy is just the sum of the mass of the three elements. Okay, so if I have a sample that I know contains a gram of cadmium and 1.78 grams of lead, all I really need to do is for that particular sample figure out how much, um, how much uh, tin it should contain, and then I can solve this problem because I could take the grams of tin and then divide by the sum of the grams of tin plus the grams of lead plus the grams of cadmium. So I'm kind of thinking here, if I could figure out the grams of tin in that sample, I'm just taking the grams of tin and adding it to 1.78 grams of lead plus 1.00 grams of cadmium, okay? And then if I multiply that by 100%, then I get a percentage. So if I, if I want to get a percent, I take the ratio, of course, multiply by 100%. Okay, so now, how can I find the grams of tin? Well, I know the mole ratio of tin to mole, uh, to, to lead. So I know the mole ratio, given how much lead there is, I know how much tin there should be, okay? So if I have 1.78 grams of lead in my sample, then I know the mole ratio of lead to tin. So what I should do is just do a simple conversion to moles for lead. So that's 207.2 grams per mole of lead. The problem at least gave us some molar masses so we wouldn't have to check our periodic table. And so then I know my ratio is for every one mole of lead that's present, there should be 2.73 moles of tin. Okay, because I'm just using that mole ratio that was given, and now I can use the gram to mole ratio, the molar mass of tin. So I can then use one mole of tin, 
contains 118.710 grams. Okay, so I'm just converting the given amount of lead within the sample that I'm considering. So 1.78 grams of lead divided by its molar mass going to moles of lead, multiplying by 2.73. <coughs> And then times 118.71. Okay. Now, if you ask me, the only thing that's silly in this problem is, like, when you get the number, you're probably first like, whoa, did that really come out to 50%? So when this comes out to 2.78 grams, you may have been confused, because I was too. My first thought was, and I went back through the arithmetic to make sure I didn't screw it up. And then I was like, okay, that's just weird that it comes out to be exactly 50%. But we just plug in 2.78 grams here and here. Because what we've just found is that if a sample contains the, the gram ratio of cadmium to lead, of one gram of cadmium, 1.78 grams of lead, and then just worked out by the mole ratio of lead to uh, tin, how much tin there'd have to be, and then just plug those numbers in and solve for the mass percent. So I don't want you getting too down on this problem. I mean, it's just kind of using the ideas of mole ratios and mass ratios and putting them into use in terms of more of like a, a word problem, if you will. So this is like that old school type math problem. You got two trains leaving, when are they gonna meet? And some people can solve those problems maybe easier than others. The test is usually not too representative of problems that look like this. So, any follow up on this one? It does work out to 50%. Okay, let's do a little naming. So um, this should be, should be fun. Um, so like you see aluminum, hydrogen, phosphite. And so you may forget the hydrogen, like oxyanions. Like the, so the hydrogen just means we have an H plus added on to phosphite. So phosphite is PO3, three minus. So an H plus added on front means that that would be H PO3 with the two minus. Because it's like the hydrogen phosphite is adding a, is adding a hydrogen ion out in front. If we add a second H plus, we'd call that dihydrogen phosphite. So like H2PO3 with a minus would be dihydrogen phosphite. If you add another H plus, what do you get? The answer would be H3PO4, which of course isn't an anion anymore. So we don't call H3PO4 trihydrogen, uh, uh, it should be a three still. Um, I don't want to change that to a four. So if we have H3PO3, that would be phosphorus acid. So once we get rid of the charge, we have H's out in front, we recognize an anion underneath, that's an acid. So that would be phosphorus acid. So these are anions, HPO3 two minus, H2PO3 with a minus, so we name them as being ions still. Once we have a fully neutralized molecule, we name that for being the molecular compound acid um, using the nomenclature system for acids. So for aluminum, hydrogen, phosphite, that would be Al3 plus HPO3 three, two minus, so I'm going to need three of the two minus, two of the three plus. So it would be Al2, HPO3, three. Chromium six oxide, hopefully we all know that there's no tricks here, that that's just chromium six plus. Doesn't mean there's like a chromium subscript six, it doesn't mean it's CrO6, there's a lot of choices you might think this might be, but it's just chromium six plus, oxides of two minus, so we need three of the oxides, so CrO3. CS2O2, what's O2 with a two minus charge? So cesium has a plus, there's two of them, there's a plus two, so what would the name of that one be? Cesium peroxide. So O2 minus is oxide, O2, two minus is peroxide, O2 with a minus is superoxide. H2SO3. Say. So sulfate is the four, so the three would be ite, so that's sulfite, so this would be sulfurous acid. Is this one? Methane, CH4, replace an H with an OH, that is methanol, so that would be methanol. Yep, so it would be methanol. So methane, and so, so my, my thought is methane, CH4, and then when you have the alcohol of it, you replace the E ending with an OL. Yeah. What's this one? 
So we can write this one a few different ways. If we write it C2H3O2, that's acetate. We could also write it more descriptively, CH3COO is also the acetate ion, so this would be acetic acid. There are two ways you can see the formula written out, CH3COOH is one of the more common ways because that tells you a little bit about the structure. We'll get into that as we go through the class. But you could also see it given as like HC2H3O2. It would be another way of writing acetic acid. So acetic acid is a little interesting, and you could write it in more of a condensed formula and come up with a name either way. Like this one just always looks funny, like periodic acid. So just if you think it's funny, like what does that mean, like periodic table, periodic acid? No, it's just like per iodate. Is what it comes down to. So which, what's the formula of iodate? Well, that's a three minus, so the per iodate is a four minus. So there should be the IO4 minus, so HIO4. <coughs> nonanol. <laughs> Sounds funny. It's the weird one. How many carbons does nonanol have? Nine. Nine, yeah. So this is the C9. How many H's should it have? 20, that was fast. Um, so if you do forget how many H's it should have, um, and then it should have an O on the end for the alcohol, that just write CH3, CH3 on the ends, and you have a bunch of CH2s in the middle. And there will be seven CH2s in the middle, so that's 14 plus six on the outside for the 20. So each carbon has four bonds. So the end carbons have three bonds to H atoms and one bond to another carbon atom. The middle carbons have two bonds to carbon atoms, only two bonds to H atoms. So you could get there a few different ways. So all you need to know is through 10. So we go through decane. Um, so known and all is probably the trickiest of them, but not even that tricky. Is there any naming stuff I didn't hit here that anybody wants to? Yes. Yeah, so the question is, you know, like, why would you write one CH3OH versus the other C9H20O? Both are, like, valid formulas. So you could write methane's, uh, methanol's formula this way, and that's, like, a legal formula. Um, I, think, I think writing it the way methanol was written first is more descriptive. So I might write this H19OH just to kind of signify one of the H's are replaced with the OH group. Uh, but either way is, is valid. So you could see an exam would give probably one of the two choices, but not both. So one is not more right than the other. Okay, uh, subatomic particle experiments to uh, talk about these again. So who discovered the electron? Yeah, J.J. Thompson. And so, and the, the key there is that it was discovered in that cathode ray tube experiment. So it was in that you know, CRT TV, the cathode ray tube, the same thing that was in those old school TVs are particles being ejected from, uh, from a substance by putting a high voltage on it. So put a ton of electricity into a substance, a particle is given off, and it flies to a screen. You can put a little potential on the screen so that negative particle flies to the potential. You could also bend the particle with uh, a magnetic field um, or an electric field so you can sort of show that the particle is negatively charged and it's something being given off by matter as it's being uh, sort of broken down with that high voltage electricity. It was um, then the next experiment that we talked about, the Millikan oil drop experiment to determine the mass and the charge of the electron. So if you're thinking of like, what's the key discovery of the cathode ray tube experiment, discovered the electron. The Millikan oil drop experiment discovered the mass and the charge of the electron. Um, the CRT experiment determined the mass to charge ratio of the electron, so they determine the mass to charge ratio or the charge to mass ratio, however you want to think of it, of the, of the electron, but they didn't determine the mass itself and the charge itself. Um, Millikan did that by creating electrons on an oil droplet and then suspending them um, with a magnetic field, or with uh, an electric field. So they would drop particles downward and then repel them back upwards with an electric field and then see how many of those particles were hitting a detector sort of above the experiment. So they're just sort of counting the particles as they were hitting a detector, and they were uh, observing particles that were found to have either one or two or three or some whole number multiple of electrons within the particles. Um, the, uh, these experiments began like the cathode ray tube was like late 1800s, the Millikan oil drop like right around the turn of the century, the early 1900s. Uh, which subatomic particle was discovered first? The electron, proton, or the neutron? The electron, so that's easy. Uh, which one was discovered last? 
the neutron, because it's neutral and charge, it's hard to discover the proton in the middle. Uh, Curie discovered the radioactivity of uh, sort of particles being given off by decaying radioactive uh, elements. So she was discovering the alpha particle, the beta particle, and I never know how to write the gamma particle. I need some, some Greek person. I don't know how gamma, we'll just do that. So the gamma particle. So this was the high voltage photon of really high energy. The beta ray was basically just an electron, and then the alpha particle was the helium nucleus. A question I just keep meaning to go find a physicist to ask is, did they know at the time it was the helium nucleus? Because I bet they didn't. They probably just knew it was a big ball of, of positive charge. Uh, because the thing they were doing was finding the particle, like the negative particle was deflected downward by a magnetic field by a lot, but this big particle was barely deflected upwards because it had more mass. Um, so the, uh, the alpha particle was not being sort of deflected upward much by an electric field, not nearly as much as the electron. So the electron was uh, much lighter um, in terms of the charge it has compared to the more massive um, nucleus. And so this was then uh, the particle. So the alpha particle is the one that was shot at the metal and Rutherford's uh, gold foil experiment. So you shoot a particle of positive charge at a metal that thought was it would go straight through, but it didn't because it was colliding with nuclei. So whenever it collides with the nuclei, it's scattered. If you make a thicker piece, we talked about this last time, a thicker piece of gold would scatter more particles because it's encountering more nuclei that scatter the particles. Make it thinner, more particles would go straight through. Um, so yeah, that's a basic experiment. So you might go back even to uh, um, Dalton's atomic theory in terms of kind of kickstarting the thought of atoms as a building block of matter, and that's like early 1800s. So the thought of atoms, early 1800s, to atomic, subatomic particle discovery in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Okay, so with that, let's look at um, this problem here. So this is like a diagram question. So we're told nitrogen, hydrogen react in a container. Uh, we're given the balanced reaction. So N2, 3H2 is combined to form ammonia. So based on the initial amounts shown in the figure above, which uh, what is present following the reaction going to completion based on the theoretical yield? Okay. So sometimes you see these like weird statements like based on the theoretical yield. That's just saying assuming the reaction goes to 100% yield is all that that means. Okay, so we're counting, we have three nitrogen molecules, one, two, three, four, five, six hydrogen molecules. So I think the easiest way to solve this problem is to lasso the 1N2 for the three H2s, and then we would make two NH3s. So I might make an NH3 and an NH3 as a result in place of those atoms, and then we can do it one more time, and then we make two more NH3s, so I have a total of four NH3s and then that one left over N2. So this is a, like a particle diagram where the particle count's relatively low. It's probably easiest just to lasso out the molecule, replace them with their products. Um, so we're gonna end up with four NH3s um, here and then that one left over N2. So we're gonna end up with box three. So two is of course wrong because we're making the wrong product. One's wrong because it's missing the N2. Uh, four is wrong because we have two reactants left over and the counts of the atoms don't make any sense. And five also is silly that it's making different products. So we can't make different products. We have to make the NH3s. We have to make two distinct NH3 molecules like shown in box three. We could do this dimensional analysis wise. We could say for three N2s, for every one N2, we get three NH3s that react. We could do for six H2s, for every three H2s that react, we get two NH3s. And so that's gonna tell us that we get four NH3s. If we consumed all the nitrogen, we would have gotten an extra um, NH3, but we don't have enough H2 to react. So you could do this with dimensional analysis. You can make a BCA chart still. You can still solve this problem a variety of ways, but probably easiest just to lasso out the molecules. Follow-ups on this one. All right, so from last class, I thought it looked, you guys, before the problem, before we put the, the results up, you're probably like, okay, we're done with sig figs, right? Um, let's make sure we're on the same page here, 50 plus 74. And we're assuming that all these values are inexact quantities. So you're just assuming that these are all inexact quantities and sig fig rules apply. So what should the result of 50 plus 74 be? My calculator says 124, but what should the answer be? 120. Okay, 
So we got to round to this placeholder. So we do 50 plus 74. So we're into this problem last class. So, uh, and I heard some people afterwards saying, I thought when we added and subtracted it was about the decimal places. And it is, but it's always about the significant decimal places. So it's about which decimal place in 50 is the last significant placeholder. Um, and that's the tens placeholder. And we add it with the ones placeholder, the result gets rounded to the tens. Okay, now I thought that this might be exemplified with a quick little example. Because like, you may be looking at this saying, this is stupid. Why would you not just give 124, right? So a lot of you guys may be really thinking, why don't we give 124? Well, whenever we say 50, imagine that 50 is being determined with a bad tool, let's say. Let's say we're, we're determining some length on a tool where um, we have a zero mark and we have a 100 mark. And then somewhere here, we have like our meniscus that we're reading off. And so when you look at that, how confident can you be in it being like 50 versus 51 versus 60? So aren't you probably reading this saying, that looks close to 50, plus or minus about 10? You know, like, my, it's, it's not 60, it's not 40, it's probably about 50. I couldn't tell you clearly if that's 55 or 45, though. Uh, we need to get some scale markings on there to really be able to tell the difference. So if you're using like a poor tool, you come up with a poor precision, and then that precision is going to be different if you use maybe a better tool. So imagine we have some other tool that has you know, more scale markings on it, and then we see some value given where we read it off to be 74 more clearly. So we have more confidence in that one's placeholder in 74, but not in the case of 50. So if you take 50 plus or minus 10 plus 74, wouldn't the result be about 114 to 134, given like your plus or minus 10 on the 50? Does that make sense? So like this uncertainty here is what's playing into the result of saying, well, if it's really 60, then it would have been 134. If it was really 50, it would have been 114. So the best I can really say is it's probably about 120 plus or minus 10. OK, so we'll just call it 120 here in general chemistry. Don't worry about the plus minus. The arithmetic done with plus minuses is, is uh, part of like stats classes. So if you go take a stats course, you're going to learn how to like propagate your uncertainties descriptively, where if you have 50 plus or minus, uh, let's say 8, let's say you determine the error there's 8. And let's say it's 74 plus or minus 1. You'll learn how to take those uncertainties and propagate those into the, the uh, um, result. And then you're probably going to find that it ends up being like 120 plus or minus 6 or something like that. So like when you use the plus minuses, the arithmetic with it, it does lead to some clarifications that might help you understand why we're rounding these values the way we're rounding them. In a stats class, you'll see more formally how you, you track these uncertainties into the results. OK, so let's look at the next problem. Why don't you guys give this one a try? I'll do it two real quick. So imagine this is a test question, and the question says, OK, you do this arithmetic. Does the result have one, two, three, four, or five, six things? What would you go with? Let me go with one. Let me go with one. Because like the calculator says four. You might be like, well, four has one sig fig. But that's not obviously how the problem works. You guys know that by now. So this is three sig figs. We do the, the top arithmetic. Um, the bottom would actually still be three sig figs. And so the result ends up having three sig figs. So it's the 4.00. So this problem here is exemplifying the reminder that we're not always rounding and cutting off values and replacing them with zero. Sometimes we're like adding zeros onto our answer. So our calculator says four, but we're seeing that this result here would really be 4.00. So it's not four plus or minus one. It's like 4.00 plus or minus 0 0.01. So we have a greater precision than just saying four for this particular answer. Any follow-ups on the middle one? So when you multiply, do the multiplication rule. Yes? Say that again? Well, the inexact, don't let that not confuse you. If, if these were all exact numbers, they would just be ordinary numbers. 
you know, like there wouldn't be like sig fig counting in ordinary numbers. So if these were exact, so the inexact just means they're all like some ordinary measurements. Um, so you're assuming that these are just some like ordinary values that uh, the sig fig rules apply to. So if you see like a problem that says, I'll assume these are inexact quantities or measurements, it just means that the sig fig rules apply to these numbers. If like you're doing like one half mv squared, the half isn't subject in that equation to sig fig rules. So the half isn't like one sig fig. You know what I mean? Because it's an exact um, part of the equation. OK, the last one. This is actually um, kind of a reminder. You guys may have seen. And it may be something you didn't understand on a, uh, on a Master in Chemistry homework set. But there's a Master in Chemistry problem kind of like this one. Let's do it in our calculators. Or if you want to just see what my calculator says, that's fine. So I do this in a calculator, 4.74 plus 7.87, um, both times 10 to the 4. Um, and if I go scientific mode, on my calculator, it says 1.261 times 10 to the 5. OK, now how many sig figs should be reported with that number? Three or four? It should be four. OK? Now, again, what you, so the confusing part of this problem is when you're looking at the 4.74 and saying it's to the hundredth place, and then you're saying you're adding 7.87. Um, to the hundredths place, and then you're changing your exponent that that hundredths place is now right here. So the hundredths place times 10 to the 4 is in the ones place holder in that number. Okay, think of it this way. If I gave you a different problem and just said you had 4.74 plus 7.87 without the times 10 to the 4, we would all agree that that should have four sig figs, right? Okay, just because we put the times 10 to the 4 doesn't, shouldn't change the number of sig figs of the results. So what really changes is just like when we change times 10 to the 5, we're changing the exponent. And that's going to change the placeholder. That's going to change like the decimal place. So a better way to do this problem, if we're not sure, would be to just write out descriptively 47400, zero, zero, because that would be 4.74 times 10 to the 4. And then write, write out descriptively 78700, zero, zero, because that would be 787 seven times 10 to the 4. And then do your arithmetic here. And then you come up with 126100. Zero, zero, and then you clearly see that that one is significant. So all four digits here are significant. So it's kind of the same problem as this one. It's just like we went from times 10 to the 4 times 10 to the 5. We have to keep track of the sig figs more carefully in the case of scientific notation. So don't let scientific notation fool you. If you see a scientific notation problem with addition and subtraction in it, probably better just to write the numbers out descriptively. Think of the addition and subtraction. Round the result appropriately from there. Follow-ups on that one. OK, so there's always nuances with sig fig rules. Um, just apply the rules sequentially. When scientific notation is involved, just carefully write the values out as needed. Combustion analysis problem. Now, these problems are always a little bit like detailed in terms of the problem-solving method. But they're also very simple, too. So it might take you a little bit of time to crunch the numbers. But I'm going to kind of show you how I might solve this problem. I don't think we could have done it this simply, though, the first time we introduced the problem. So let me, uh, let's go through the problem real quick. So it says we have a 12.01 gram sample that contains CH and O. And I'll give you guys a reminder. This could have been N or CL or whatever. It could have been any other third element. It's most often oxygen. Um, because we're determining the mass of carbon in the sample from the CO2 mass. We're saying from the CO2 mass, 14.08 grams, how much of that is carbon? Because all that carbon came from our sample to like 100% yield. And then the same thing, all the hydrogen in water is, uh, all the hydrogen in our sample is converted to water. So the 4.32 grams of water is, uh, contains all the hydrogen from our sample to like perfect 100% yield. So we should be able to figure out how much carbon our sample contains in grams, how much hydrogen it contains in grams. So can I find the grams of carbon in our sample from the CO2 mass? So I'm taking 14.08 grams of CO2. So if I take 14.08 grams of CO2, if I multiply that by the percent C in CO2, does that accomplish the task of telling me how much carbon's in CO2? Now, what's the percent C in CO2? So like 12.01 divided by 44.01. It's like the mass of carbon divided by the mass of the whole compound. So we might just say, OK, this is just 12.01 grams divided by 44.01 grams, because that's the mass of CO2. For a mole of it, that's the mass of a mole of carbon. 
So we can really shorthand the arithmetic. It's really pretty straightforward once you understand the problem. So we go 14.08 times 12.01 divided by 44.01. And that tells me, uh, let me go back to floating mode. Do you guys know how to change your calculators to scientific mode? That's sometimes helpful. If you have a bunch of zeros and you're trying to count and you're stressed out on a test, just switch over to scientific mode on these ones. It's just like the second button and then arrow over to scientific. Um, and then floating is normal, so you probably have to switch back to floating mode if you ever do switch. But that's a little trick. If you have scientific notation and you're trying to figure out the answer, it might be helpful. But it's 3.84 grams of carbon. Okay, so I have 3.84 grams of carbon. Now how about hydrogen? How much hydrogen is in the sample? 4.32 grams of water, 2.016 grams of hydrogen is present, and 18.02 grams of water. So that's just the percent H in water. So just multiplying the mass of water times the percent H of water, that gives me 0.4833 grams. Okay, so it's just 2.016 grams of H per 18.02 grams of water is my percent H in water. Does that make sense? Okay, so I'm not like showing the steps meticulously. I may be doing some arithmetic, but I'm thinking I'm getting a ratio of my masses. So I get a ratio of the moles and go to a simplest whole number ratio. And so how many grams of oxygen are there? Well, I had a 12 gram sample. I thought it was weird that it, ate, that it just happened to be the molar mass of carbon, but I think that's just a weird oddity of this problem. I don't think there's any significance to the mass of the sample being 12.01 grams, but. So don't let that trip us up. So we minus the mass of carbon and then minus the mass of hydrogen. So there's a lot of oxygen in the sample. So there is uh, 7.69 grams of oxygen in the sample. So anyways. That might help me eliminate some of the choices if I wanted to think about narrowing in on the targets. But all I need to do here is go to moles of each of these. Can I go to moles easily? Like, can I take the grams of carbon, 3.84, divide by 12.01? That's easy enough, isn't it? So that's like 0 0.3197 moles of carbon present in a ratio to 0.4833 grams divided by 1.008 grams of hydrogen. So that's 0 0.4794 moles of hydrogen. So the only key here is when I have mass of carbon, mass of hydrogen, mass of O, I'm using the molar mass of just H atom here. So 1.008 or 1600 for oxygen. So I'm converting 7.69 grams of oxygen to moles. So it's just that divided by 16.00. So 0.4806. Okay, so my moles of hydrogen to oxygen are, are equal, right? So for every mole of H, I have a mole of O, because they're both 0.48. So that means it's A or B. And so then uh, in terms of dividing by the smallest, so if I divide all these by the smallest and then think from there, 0.47. 94 divided by 0.3197 is 1.5. So you see, I'm kind of shorthanding this arithmetic. If I understand the arithmetic, I can shorthand it and figure out the answer. I can double all these, so it's C2H3O3. Um, if I can't shorthand it, I'm just writing the steps out and being meticulous and probably saving this problem for last, you know, because it's going to take me, you know, a few minutes to go through all that setup. But it's not going to take me a few minutes to go through the setup if I understand these steps very well. If I understand the steps well, this is still a two or three minute problem. If I got to write all the steps out, maybe it's a five minute problem. I don't know. Depends on where you guys are at. Questions on this one? <coughs> 